from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2018. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, we are here live in Las Vegas for theCUBE's exclusive coverage for three days, VMworld 2018. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Andy Bechtelstein, who's the founder and chief development officer and chairman of Arista Networks. More importantly, he's also the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, invested in Larry and Sergey when they're in their PhD programs, legend in the industry, great to have you on, super excited to have you join this conversation. A pleasure to be here today. So first question is, besides all the luminary things you've done in your career, what's it like working with Jay Shree at Arista? Well, uh, I actually met Jay Shree 30 years ago when she was at AMD selling us uh, FTDI chips at Sun Microsystems. So I, I guess this dates both of us, but um, I've worked with her uh, for all the years when I was at Cisco, obviously, and then we both started at Arista in uh, 2008. So we've both been there now for 10 years uh, <laughs> together. In fact, the 10 year anniversary is coming up next month. H3 is a great CUBE alumni. Uh, she's an amazing person, great technologist. We miss her, we wish she was here having more conversations with us on theCUBE. But stepping back, I mean, over your career, you've seen many ways of innovation. You were involved in all of them, big ones happening. Semiconductor, computers, and now with Arista going forward, and now cloud. Did you know rock, the rocket ship of Arista was going to be this big? I mean, we, we, you designed it out at the beginning. What was the, 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 the itch you were scratching in? Did you know it was going to be a rocket ship? Well, we, we, we had some very early, what led to the founding of Arista was we um, had lunch with um, our best friends at Google and Larry himself told me that the biggest problem they had was not servers, but actually the networking and scaling that to the future size of their data centers. And they were going to go off to build their own network uh, products because there was no commercial product on the market that would meet that need. So we thought, you know, with the emergence of Merchant Silicon, we could make a contribution there. And the focus of the company was actually on, on the cloud networking from the very beginning even though that wasn't even well understood in the industry as being a major opportunity. So when we shipped our first uh, products in 2009, 2010, many of them, besides, we had some business on Wall Street, low latency, but uh, the majority of the opportunity was always the cloud. It's interesting you mentioned the Google and Larry and Sergey, met Larry in particular about that time in history. You go back and look at what Google was doing at that particular time, and now what they talked about at Google Cloud, they were building their own large scale system, right, and there's massive scale involved. Yeah, they, had about, they had about 100,000 servers in the early 2004 before they went public. Now they have who knows how many millions, right? <laughs> and all of course the latest technology now. Um, so the, the, the sheer size of the cloud, the momentum the cloud has, I think was hard to forecast. Um, we did think there was going to be a shift, but the shift was in fact more rapid than we expected. Yeah, a Andy, uh, you talked about cloud networking, but today we still see there, there's such a huge discrepancy between what networking is happening in the data center and the networking that's happening in the hyperscalers. At this show, we're starting to hear about some of the multi-cloud. You had some integrations between Arista and VMware that are starting to pull some of those together. But maybe you could give us a little bit about what you're seeing between you know, the data center and the enterprise versus the hyperscalers when it comes right, to networking. So, so um, the data enterprise uh, has still largely what we would call a legacy approach to networking, which dates back you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And um, many of those networks are, are still in place and, and you know, progressing very slowly. But there also are enterprise customers who want to take advantage of what the cloud has done in terms of cloud networking, including you know, the much better scalability, the much better resiliency, the much greater automation. So all these benefits do apply equally well to the enterprise, but it is a transition for customers you know, to fully embrace that. Uh, so the work we're doing together with VMware on integrating our uh, cloud vision, our physical switches with the micro segmentation is one element of that. But, but the bigger topic is simply uh, an enterprise that wants to move into the future really should look at you know, how did the cloud people build their networks, how can they run a very large data center with you know, 10 network admins instead of you know, hundreds of people. And the, 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 especially the automation that we have been able to provide to our customers, automatic updating of software, being able to 
bring in bring out new releases into a running network without bringing the network down, you know, nobody could even think about doing that 10 years ago. Yeah, you, you, you bring up a great point about automation. I loved it. in the keynote this morning, Pat Gelsinger talked about what, what was it? 39 years ago, he did something at Intel. Said we we're going to do AI. Didn't quite call it AI back then, but he said, and now we're starting to see the fruits of what come out. You know, in the networking world, we've been talking about for decades automating the network more. You live through you know, the one gig, you know, 10 gig, 40 gig, 400 gig you're talking about. Are we ready for automation now? Is now that moment well, networking? I think people are ready for 30 years, but yeah. the weird thing is, you know, there always was a, a control plane in the network, you know, the, the routing protocols. But for management, there was never really a true management plane, meaning the, the legacy way is you dial in with SNMP into each switch and configure you know, your, your access list manually, more or less. And, and that's really a bad way of doing it because humans do make mistakes, you end up with inconsistent, inconsistencies and a lot of network outages virtually has been traced to literally human mistake. So our approach with what we call Cloud Vision, which is a central point that can manage your entire base of Arista switches in a data center, it's all automated. You want to update a thing, you push a button and it happens. And there's no more dialing into SNMP into individual switches. How would you advise people who are looking at the architecture of the cloud, who are replatforming? Large enterprises have been legacy all, the, all day long. You mentioned earlier just now on theCUBE that how the cloud guys were laying out the network was fundamental how they grew. How should and how do people lay out the networks for cloud today? How would you, yeah, how do you so, see so, that? Um, so the three big things that happened was uh, Merchant Silicon has taken over because it's quite frankly much more scalable than traditional chips. Um, and, and that's just the hardware, right? Then the leaf spine architecture that uh, really our customers pioneered, but is, is the standard in the cloud. It is, you know, use ECMP for load balancing, it, it works. It's, it's the most resilient, I mean, the one thing, the single most important thing in the cloud is no outages, no downtime. You know, the network works, no excuses, right? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and our customers tell us that, you know, with our products and the leaf spine approach, you know, they have a, a better experience in terms of resiliency than any other vendor. So that, that's a very strong endorsement and that's as relevant to an enterprise customer as to a cloud customer. And then the automation benefit. Now, to get the automation benefit, you know, you have to standardize on a new way of doing it, that's, that's true. But it's just such a, a reduction in complexity and, and simplification. You know, you can actually look at this as an uh, OPEX saving opportunity, quite frankly. Uh, and you know, in the cloud, they wouldn't have it any other way. They couldn't afford it, right? They have very large data centers, and they only could operate these things in a fully automatic fashion. Andy, I want to get your reaction to what Pat Gelsinger said on stage this morning. He said, in the old days, the oh, I'm paraphrasing, the network would dictate what the applications could do. It would enable that, and we saw an enabling capability. Now with cloud, the apps can program the network. I'm paraphrasing that. As networks become more programmable and no outages, um, he made a quote, he said, the old adage was the network is the computer, the new adage is right. the, application, the application is a network. Okay, so let, What's your let, reaction let, let to let those me try things? To translate it sounds this. like so, an old Sun slogan, so, doesn't yeah, it? No, uh, uh, translate that for us. So, um, the, uh, the, micro, the virtual networking, the NSX environment, which provides security at the application level, right? It's the natural way to do network security, because you really want to be as close to the application as you can physically be, or virtually be, which is right in the VM environment. So VMware clearly has the, uh, the, the best position in the industry to provide that level of security, which is all software, software-defined networking. You do your you know, security policies at that level. Where we come in is with Cloud Vision now, we have announced a way to integrate with NXS, NSX micro-segmentation such that we can learn the policies and map them back down to the access list of the physical network to further enhance that security. So we don't actually create a separate silo for yet another policy management. We truly operate within their policy framework, which means you have the natural segmentation between the security engineers which manage the security policies yeah. and networking engineers that manage the physical so network. highly optimized for the environment. Which actually works. Right. It, so now, is that what you call macro segmentation then? Well, we used to, to call it macro, but we yeah. are actually not part of their micro thing because <laughs> yeah. we truly learn their policy. So if you update a policy, it gets reflected back down to Cloud Vision and your physical networks, and it applies to physical switches, physical assets, physical servers, mainframe storage, whatnot, right? So it's a very smooth integration, 
And, and we think it's, it's a demo at this point, but it, it will work and it's an open framework you know, that allows us to work with VMware. Let me ask you a personal question. Looking at the industry, back in, even look back in history for, as an illustration, TCP IP opened up, remember the old OSI stack, the, everyone tried to do that. Oh, TCP IP opened up so much on networking, internetworking. Is there a technology enabler in cloud that you see that's going to have that kind of impact? Is it an NSX? How do customers going to deal with the multiple clouds? I mean, is there an interoperability framework coming? Do you see a, a real disruptive technology enable that'll have that kind of impact that TCP spawn massive opportunity and wealth creation and startups and functionality? Is there a right. moment so, coming? So TCP, of course, was the, the proper layering of a network between the physical layer, you know, layer one, layer two, and the, the routing or the internet layer, which is layer three. And, and without that, you know, this is a back to the old end-to-end -end argument, you know, we wouldn't have what we have today on the internet. That, that was the only rational way to build an architecture that could actually, and, and I'm not sure if people had a notion, you know, in 1979 when TCP was submitted that it would become that big. They probably would have picked a bit bigger address space, you know, <laughs> if they'd known. But it was, it, that not just the longevity, but the, the impact it had was just phenomenal, right? Now, and, and that applied in terms of connectivity and you know, how many things you have to understand about network to talk from point A to B. The, the NSX level of network management is a little different because it's much higher level. It's really a management plane, back to the point I made earlier about management planes, that allows you to integrate a cloud on your premise with one at Amazon or at IBM or in the future Google and, and so on. In, in a way that you can have full visibility and you see, you know exactly what's going on, all the security policies. But this has been a dream for people to deliver, but it requires to actually have a reasonable amount of code in each of these places, both on your server. It's not, it's not just a protocol, it's an implementation of a capability, right? And uh, VMware NSX is the best solution that's available today and that I can see for that use case, which is going to be very important to a large number of enterprises, many of which want to have a smooth connection between uh, on-premise and off-premise, and in the future to edge telco and, and other things that don't even run a VM environment today, but that will allow them to be fully, securely linked into such a network. So you see that as a leading product it, to it's, connect. It's definitely a leading product. I mean, they have the most customers, the most momentum, the most market share. There isn't anything even close in terms of the, call it the software-defined networking layer, which is what NSS implements. And we are very proud to partner with them at the physical layer to interact with their policies. Do you think that's going to have an impact of accelerating the multi-cloud world? Yes, because the, the whole point about multi-cloud is it has to be sort of vendor independent or, I don't know, vendor neutral. You, you are going to see solutions from you know, Amazon and Azure to bring their own sort of public cloud into the premise, but that only works with their backend, right? Yeah. So there, there will be other offerings there, but in terms of true multi-cloud, I don't see any competition. And, and I would love to get your, your viewpoint on the, the future of Ethernet. I hear so many people the last few years, it's like, well, uh, on the processor side, more law, Moore's, Moore's Law has played out. We can't get smaller. On the Ethernet side, there's not going to be the investment to be able to help get us to the next generation. There's limits in the technology. You've, you've, you've lived through so many of these architectural changes. You know, are, are we at the end of innovation uh, you know, for no, Ethernet? Not at all, so my, my history with Ethernet dates back 40 years, so <laughs> I uh, worked on the first three megabit Ethernet at Xerox Park still, and you know, then it was 10 megabit, 100 megabit, gigabit, 10, 40, 100, and now 400 coming out. So, so see, Ethernet tra speed transitions are really just um, substitutions of the previous layer two technology, meaning assuming they're more cost effective, they do get adopted very quickly. Of course, you need the right optics, you need the right equipment, but it's a very predictable uh, tr uh, roadmap. I mean, I guess it's not like adopting a new protocol, right? It's just faster and, and more, more bandwidth cost efficient. So we are on the verge of 400 gigabits becoming available in the market. Uh, it will really roll out, roll out in any kind of volume next calendar year and then an even bigger volume in 2000. But in the meanwhile, you know, 100 meg Ethernet excuse me, 100 gigabit Ethernet is still the fastest growing thing the industry has ever seen. It went from a, a million ports back in 2016 to call it five million ports last calendar year, expected over 10 million ports this year, expected 20 million ports next year. I mean, this is a speed of adoption that's unheard of. 
And, and we are at Arista, we are fortunate enough to be actually the market leader in 100 gigabit adoption. We have shipped more 100 gig ports than any other vendor, including Cisco, for the last two years. Um, so our ability to embrace new speeds and bring new technologies to market is, I would say, unparalleled. We have a very good track record there. And we're working really hard, you know, sort of burning the midnight oil to extend this to the 400 gig area, which is going to be a, another important upgrade, especially in the cloud. Uh, I should mention that the cloud is the early adopter of all the higher speeds. This is mature in the 100 gig will be more than 400 gig. I'm not sure too many enterprises need 400 gig, but the cloud is ready to get going as soon as it's cost effective. Andy, for the folks that are looking at this 20 year wave coming that we're seeing kind of cloud, and it's been talked about on stage and here on theCUBE, oh, it's going to be a 20 year run, transforming the infrastructure. What's the, in your mind's eye, what do you see as the most disruptive thing that people aren't talking about in networking? What's, uh, what's going to be some things that might happen in the next 10 years in your mind that, that, that might happen that people aren't really aware of, that might not see it coming? Any innovations that on the horizon that you're excited about or people might not expect? Yeah, well the cloud trend is fairly predictable. I would say, you know, all the uh, IDC, you know, uh, all the analysts have predicted like, that have big numbers on adoption have been pretty spot on. And if you look at the annual growth rate for cloud adoption, it's 40, 45, 50, and, and more percent. Um, now, what, what's, there's a good question, of course, how the, the big cloud vendors in the end will compete against each other. You got you know, Amazon is the biggest. Um, Microsoft is actually growing apparently faster than Amazon right now, but they have some catching up to do. And, and Google working overtime you know, to, to get bigger. And um, they, they may differentiate in terms of uh, their sp specific focus. For example, Google has a lot of AI technology uh, internally that they've used for their own uh, business and um, with TensorFlow and so on, they're arguably ahead of others, and they may just bet the farm on AI, right, and big data analytics and things like that, which are very compelling business opportunities for any, any enterprise customer. So the potential uh, value that can be created uh, deploying AI correctly is in the perhaps trillions of dollars in the next 10 years, but it probably doesn't make sense for company, for most companies to build their own AI data center because you need a huge yeah, capital yeah. expense, a huge, and how, how, what hardware do you use? It's going to evolve very quickly. So that may be one of the classical cases where you want to actually start in the cloud and you know, the only reason to ever move it on site is you have a well-defined environment, right? Um, so I would actually say it's the new applications that may start in the cloud that you know, haven't even rolled out it in volume, like AI, that will maybe the biggest change that people didn't expect. Final question, what's the future of Arista? Oh, we're, we're just working really hard to you know, be the best uh, provider of, of products, of making the best products for our customers, uh, both for the cloud and for enterprise. And um, one thing I was going to mention about Arista is that you know, people think we're selling network boxes, which is not as which we do but the vast majority of our investment is actually software, not, not hardware. So we have over 90% of our uh, R&D headcount is in software, and so the, the right way to think about it is actually we're a software company, not really a hardware company. And, and the thing we have internally is that, you know, uh, hardware, hardware is easy, software is hard, uh, because it's actually true. Software is much, much harder than building hardware these days, and uh, the EOS software is now well over 10 million lines of codes, you know, written by th over thousands of man years of engineering. Uh, so it has been a, a tremendous journey we've been on, but we, we're still, you know, scratching the surface of what we can do. And the focus of the software, obviously it makes sense, software defined is driving everything. What are the key focus areas on the software that you guys are looking at? What's the key priorities for Arista? Yeah, we, we have talked about extending our business, you know, beyond the data center into the campus. Uh, we announced our very first acquisition recently, which is actually a Wi-Fi company. But I can guarantee you it's going to be a software-defined <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi network, not a legacy <laughs> controller-based approach, right? Uh, for, for enterprise, right? And um, we're not that interested in the hardware, we're really interested in providing a better managed solution to our customers. A lot of IoT action. Andy, thanks for taking the time to come on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Great to meet yeah, you sure. and have you on theCUBE. Great conversation here. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman, breaking down all the top coverage of VMworld 2018, getting the, getting the input and the commentary from industry legends and also key leaders in the innovation cloud networking. This is theCUBE, stay with us for more after this short break. <laughs>